In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Revelation chapter 7. And I've titled the message, Sovereignly Sealed by God. And so, <clears throat> in our study of the book of Revelation together, we come to the seventh chapter. And this chapter forms a parenthesis between the six seals that have been broken in chapter 6 and the final seal that is broken in chapter 8. And so you might be sitting here thinking, what's a, what's a parenthesis? What's he talking about? And so in writing, a parenthesis is an insertion into the text that's used to supply additional information and insight to expand the reader's understanding of what's going on. So think about if you're writing to somebody, don't we often sometimes will clarify something? We'll be writing and then we'll just tuck a little something in that's going to help them understand it better and then we keep going on. And in reality, the text is complete. What we're writing is complete without that parenthetical insertion, but it just gives a little bit of insight, a little bit more understanding or clarity or emphasis to what we're sharing. And so that's what's going on. Um, without the inclusion of chapter 7, if you were just reading your Bible, uh, Revelation would remain seamless. And so if you read chapter 6, you end with a six seal. If you went straight to eight and there was no chapter seven, it'd say, hey, when he breaks the seventh seal. And so you, would, you wouldn't realize that you were missing anything. But we would fail to benefit from all that we discover in the two visions that John has given and records for us. And so that, he tucks a couple of visions in there, and, and he tucks it in now in between, by the Holy Spirit, between chapter six and chapter eight. <clears throat> and so in this chapter, we're introduced to two important companies of believers. There'll be two distinct companies that we look at. And the question from the end of the previous chapter, who is able to stand, is answered. And after having looked at all that's unleashed on the earth and the breaking of the first six seals, Chapter 7 is a wonderful relief as we see even in the execution of his judgment, God, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, extends his grace and mercy by saving an innumerable multitude of people during the time of the tribulation. And so there's a question, if the church has been raptured and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the world is removed with them as they're taken to heaven, then we wonder who is left to evangelize the rest of the world? Isn't that our job as the church? It's our, our, our job as the church to communicate the gospel and share his message of salvation. And so chapter 7 provides the explanation as we see the Lord powerfully working through a special group of his chosen, chosen people to save countless souls during this time of tremendous trouble and tribulation. And so as we read that, it's a quite an amazing realization and comfort as we see God operating. We can, we can tend to think or, and see revelation now that we're into this third and final stage as only God's judgment being poured out. But we need, without this insertion, we would fail to realize our God is a saving God. Our God is a God of salvation. 
He doesn't just pour out judgment. And by the way, let us not forget, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But I wish that everyone would repent. And then I could have mercy and show grace and relent from, from the disaster that I must bring. But in this, we see the beauty of who our God is. And the grace of God even in the middle of judgment. And so it's a wonderful relief for John and for us as we're, we're heading through the book of Revelation. And so, if you have your Bibles, <coughs> let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 7. And so John, he says here, After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. After these things, what things is John referring to? The previous chapter, chapter 6. With the breaking of the first six seals, there's the appearance of the Antichrist. That was on the first the first uh, horse, the first rider. And then there was unleashed great warfare. There was famine, death by sword, by hunger, by plague, by wild animals, the martyrdom of believers in Christ. We read about that. And then finally, the cosmic convulsions in the heavens and earth, which included an earthquake of unequaled magnitude, the blacking out of the sun, the moon turning to blood, the stars of heaven falling to the earth, the sky being rolled back as a scroll, and every mountain and every island being moved, being shaken out of their place. And so severe and so terrifying are these judgments that we read in verse 15 of chapter 6 that no one was unaffected by these events. No one was indifferent. No one was immune. No one says, well, that doesn't affect me. And in fact, this is what we read. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, see, they had their own special prayer meeting. And they prayed to the creation and they said, please, please crush us. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And then this question, who is able to stand? They realize how in, in our modern vernacular, we're toast. The Lord is, in the King James, is wroth. He's very angry. He's coming with judgment. And so John says, so, so those are the things that we're talking about after the breaking of the first six seals and everything <clears throat> that is contained. John says he saw four angels. So he's given a, a, a new vision that interrupts See, it's chronological, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we have an insertion in between six and seven. And by the way, this insertion doesn't mean that it's happening, happening chronologically in time, but what it means is I saw these first six seals, and then I saw this, and I saw that. And then he continues seeing what he's seeing it as God is presenting it to him as the revelation is coming. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the exact chronology. And so <clears throat> he saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, 
on the sea or on any tree. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the four angels pictured standing at the four points of the compass, right? The four corners of the earth. We could say north, south, east, west. It's indicating that God's judgment is going to be worldwide. It's going to be symbolizes it's all encompassing the four corners of the earth. And so these angels are waiting to unleash the catastrophic events that have been referred to in chapter 6. And so this is the calm before the storm of God's destruction. And you'll read some of the commentators, they'll, they see um, symbolized in the earth and the sea and the trees, they'll see that as representing <coughs> the governments of the world, the Gentile peoples, and their power. But we, we also know that this is definitely literal as well as revealed in the breaking of the seventh seal in chapter 8 and what follows. Because when we read in there, we'll say that something came down, right? Struck the earth and a third of the trees and the vegetation were burned up and the sea was turned to blood and these various things. It's talking about a physical, it's not just symbolic, but I guarantee that the governments of the world and the Gentile nations and everything that they possess and their power is definitely broken and shaken when these literal things happen. Think about if your your entire water source was contaminated. Do you think it might touch the government? Do you think they might be calling the mayor, the governor, the National Guard? You know, it's going to affect both. It's going to affect everything. And in the scriptures, winds, and I could give you many, many examples, but they're symbolic of the means God uses to execute his purposes and his judgments. Let me just give you a couple of, of examples. In Exodus chapter 14, the Lord used a strong east wind to blow all night to divide the waters of the Red Sea. And with that wind, he turned the seabed into dry land so that Moses and the children of Israel could escape from Pharaoh and his army. And so by the means of the wind, God brings forth his purpose. And in Jeremiah 4, the Lord used the wind as a judgment against his people. And he said through the prophet, the time is coming when the Lord will say to the people of Jerusalem, my dear people, a burning wind is blowing in from the desert. And it's not a gentle breeze useful for winnowing grain. This isn't a good, this isn't, this is not the Delta breeze on a hot day when you're super happy. You're like, Oh, I'm so thankful for the breeze. This is not that. It is a roaring blast sent by me, says God. Now I will pronounce your destruction. And, and we'll read of things where the wind comes in and he brought all the, the destroying locusts. That wiped everything out. And, and similar things, you can find various passages. And so, <clears throat> here in verse 1, the four destructive winds are not going to be allowed to blow and bring ruin on the earth or the sea or any tree until something happens. Not until the servants of God have first been sealed and so God, they're standing there, they're waiting, they're ready to do what they're going to do. And we, we turn to verse 2, someone comes. <clears throat> then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and see, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. 
And so he's been given the seal to mark them and seal them. He says, time out, don't unleash what you're about to do until I get these guys sealed. <clears throat> In ancient times, sometimes slaves would be branded on the back of their hands or on their foreheads to permanently identify whom they belong to. In the tribulation, what we're going to read in a few chapters later, in mockery of the Holy Spirit who seals every believer in Christ Jesus, we read that everyone, whether small or great, rich or poor, free or slave, will be required to take the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one can buy or sell anything without that mark, which is either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. And although it's a death sentence to be found without the mark of the beast, to refuse, in the tribulation, if you are alive and here on the earth and you refuse the mark of the beast, that's a death sentence. But although, although it is, in defiance of the beast and in allegiance to Jesus Christ, these sealed servants of God will proudly and prominently display God the Father's name on their foreheads for the world to see. And so we ask the question, okay, so who is this first company of believers, these servants of God, who have been sealed according to the angel's command. They're simply Jewish saints from the 12 tribes of Israel who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ in the early part of the tribulation. And the seal on their forehead brands them as belonging to God and guarantees that they'll be preserved alive during the seven years of the tribulation. And this is one of those things like like a lot of things in Revelation or the Bible, but the 144,000, where you'll hear all kinds of outlandish, ridiculous, crazy interpretations and ideas. But rest assured, this is not 144,000, you know, select members of a 20th century Gentile cult that only are going to be saved and sent to heaven or any other thing that you could imagine, and this is not, you know, this is not the church, and this is not, you know, Israel remade and renewed and all this stuff. The text is so plain. This is 12,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel. And just to be certain that we understand the point, each one is going to be named one one by one, all the tribes. And so, verse 4, John heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And before I read them, by the way, too, in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the genealogical records were destroyed. And so there's this whole thing of, oh, we don't even know who belongs to what tribe. It's all been lost. Do you think that matters to God? Do you think God doesn't know who's descended from who? Do you think he can't supernaturally? You think he's not smart enough to know how to get 12,000? From each tribe, tribe, and so there's this whole thing of there's always detractors, there's always all this stuff, and it's it's like we said a couple of weeks ago. If you could believe Genesis one one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I think God is smart enough to keep track of who's who. He's got a who's who in heaven. And he could pick 12,000 from each tribe. I have no problem with this. 12 times 12. 
144,000. Pretty simple math. God knows how to do it. He can keep it. If you want to take Jesus at his word, he says that God knows the very numbers of the hair on every person's head at any moment of time. And do you think that number is not constantly changing? I just took a bath. A couple went down the drain. Did God notice that? I look at my wife's hairbrush. Seems to be changing. It seems like an ever-moving target. What is this saying? God has perfect knowledge that we cannot comprehend. I mean, how many hairs are on all our heads just in this room? That's a whole lot. I can't, I can't go that eye, right? I don't want to waste my time. But it's not a waste of time for God because he has perfect knowledge. So 12,000 people from 12 tribes. It's pretty simple math for God. He's like, that's, that's like three hairbrushes. You know, in some people's house. Other people, you know. I won't, I won't talk about it. Let's go to verse uh, verse 5. <clears throat> of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And so there's a couple of things that are unique to this particular listing of the 12 tribes of Israel. And if, if you are kind of, you know, you remember all the 12 tribes, you know, back from early Genesis and, and forward. Notably absent is the tribe of Dan as well as the tribe of Ephraim. And it's thought that Dan and Ephraim were removed because they were leaders in idolatry among the tribes. And, and you know that idolatry was the big national sin that got Israel in hot water, got them exiled. And just think of being the leaders, the ones who really led them into that. That was a big deal to God. And so that's, we don't know for certain, but it's probably a pretty good, it would be a good reason to not be in this list. And some think that the Antichrist will come from Dan, according to a couple scriptures. One is Genesis 49, 17 in which Jacob, he's speaking from his deathbed, and so he begins to pronounce a blessing over each son and speak over them what's going to happen in the days to come. <clears throat> and, and he says, when he gets to Dan, he says, Dan will be a snake beside the road, a poisonous viper along the path that bites the horse's hooves, so its rider is thrown off. That doesn't sound too uh, perky. And before his death, about the tribe of Dan, Moses said this, Dan is a young lion. He leaps out from Bashan. And it's interesting, the only other being in the scriptures who is associated with both animals is Satan. The ancient serpent named the devil who prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So it is, it's an interesting parallel there. And Ephraim is replaced by his father, Joseph. So you remember, Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so Ephraim's not on the list, but now Joseph, who's not usually in the list, he is now in this list. <clears throat> and Dan is replaced by Levi. 
the only place where Levi is, um, this is the only place where Levi is included in the list of the 12 tribes after the death of Moses. The thing was, Levi's, they didn't have an inheritance. They had the, uh, the cities that were, the priestly cities that were given to them. And that was their inheritance, but not land. <coughs> and so, Judah, also, you know, it's, you're like, hey, well, how come Reuben isn't listed first? He was the oldest. Judah is listed first because Jesus proceeded from the tribe of Judah and probably because Reuben forfeited his birthright as the firstborn in sinning with his father's concubine. And so that was a big black mark on, on Reuben. And so one, uh, one pastor I was reading from online, online comments, he says this, out of the millions of Jews on earth, 144,000 will be saved and sealed and commissioned as evangelists <clears throat> during the tribulation on earth. They are a core of redeemed Jews who are instrumental in the salvation of many Jews and Gentiles during the tribulation. And he says, these are the first fruits of the Jews. And so there's, there's several passages. We're told in Zechariah 12.10 and 13.1 that the Jewish people will be converted um, in mass to the Lord <coughs> at the moment of his second coming. And then Paul writes, he writes about this in Romans 11, 25 through 26. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters. Writing, he's writing to Gentiles, but he's writing to the whole church, but specifically the Gentiles, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. As the scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And so these 144,000, they're basically the, the forerunners they're in the vanguard. They're the first fruits. And with their evangelization, people will be saved during the tribulation. And in fact, it may be the greatest revival in history because according to the Bible, it describes their number as a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And so how amazing is this, that God, he raptures and removes the church. And so, yeah, our, our Bibles are left here, and I don't know if they still have YouTube or what they get on at that point. They could watch, you know, sermons. They could, they're going to have literature. They're going to have books. They're going to have media. They're going to have Bibles. But what about living witnesses and examples here among them to shine the light? And God redeems and he seals 144,000 who have a special task. And he uses them. And now we're going to come to this next section, a multitude who comes out of the great tribulation. And so these are probably the fruits of their evangelistic efforts. <clears throat> and if you'll look there in verse 9, we come to the second company. Of believers, and so he had he had one vision. He said, "This is what I saw of those who were sealed." And now he says, verse nine: After these things, after the sealing of the hundred and forty-four thousand, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These people are excited. They were saved out of the great tribulation. And now, having gone through that, 
They're standing before the throne and they got a song to sing. These guys are happy. And this, this multitude, as we've said, it's made up of those who have been saved during the tribulation. What's interesting, some of you came to the Lord later in life. Some came early. But imagine being one of those. Maybe, you know, you'd been shared with, your family went to church. You're like, I'm not into that. They get raptured. You're left behind. And then you get saved. You're thinking, dang, I should have listened. I should have. I wish I would have went up with the first load, right? I should have got on the first bus. But thank God for second chances. Thank God that there's a second bus coming, right? You just don't want to miss that one. Don't, hey, once bitten, twice shy. You're like, I learn from your mistakes. Okay, don't repeat history. But these are the ones who came to Christ <clears throat> through the faithful witness of the 144,000 Jewish believers whom God had sealed and commissioned for this very purpose. Their white robes symbolize the dignity and the honor given them as they are dressed in the righteousness of Christ, while the palm branches speak of victory, joy, and their complete deliverance by God from every enemy. In response to the amazing grace of God saving all these souls, the angels, elders, the four living creatures, they all burst out in a hymn of praise, and it's a sevenfold blessing that they want to tell God. Verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, <clears throat> Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I never get tired of, and then all the angels and all the elders and all the, the living creatures, they all fell down and they praised God and they ascribed to Him the glory that He's due. I'm never going to get old, you know, tired of that. It doesn't get old. I love that song. I love that scene. I love that album. I love that anthem. God deserves that and so much more. And we're going to sing the song of all the saints and the angels in heaven will be there. Those that have placed their, their faith in Christ Jesus. And so as John is watching this amazing scene, here they go again. Everybody's worshiping. Everyone's going crazy. Everyone's bowing down flat on their face before the throne. One of the elder elders comes over and he wants to focus John's attention on those who are standing before the, before the throne <coughs> and before the Lamb. Verse 13. So John's watching this scene. And he's like enraptured. And then one of the elders answered saying to me, Hey, who are these arrayed in white robes? Where'd they come from? And John's like, hey, whoa. I said to him, sir, you know. Why are you asking me? Sure, I need you to tell me, but would you tell me? Surely you know. <coughs> F.B. Myers says, when faced with an inexplicable mystery, how comforting it is to be able to say in perfect faith, Thou knowest. You're like, I don't know, but you know what? I know you know. And I'm with you. So I'm safe. I, I'm good. So in, in simple childlike faith, John simply says, you know. <laughs> He's inviting. He's like, you know, want to let me in? I don't know. But that's a good question. Who are these people standing there? arrayed in white robes before the throne. <clears throat> and here in the explanation of the elder, we realize the fulfillment of the fifth seal. 
And so in chapter 6, verse 9, the fifth seal speaks of the martyrdom of some people, right? <clears throat> and it says, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, Oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they've done to us? Then, and now see if this sounds familiar, a white robe was given to each of them, and this is what they're told. Hey, you guys, rest a little longer until the full number of your brothers and sisters, your fellow servants of Jesus, who are to be martyr, martyred, join you. And so notice that these first martyrs who were waiting under the altar in chapter 6, right? They're dressed in white robes, <clears throat> but it's not until the full number of their brothers and sisters, those who come out of the great tribulation had joined them, that they were all giving, given palm branches and victory. All right, so it's, it's not time to celebrate yet in the breaking of the fifth seal. You're the first wave. You're the first martyrs, but there's going to be a lot more. And we're going to wait till that full number comes in. And when we, when we see how God, you know, vindicates you, you'll be given a palm branch. And then you'll all shout in victory and joy and celebration as you overcome. <clears throat> and so they were faithful to the Lord, these, these who come out of the tribute. That's the thing about not going in the first load. <laughs> if you go in the second load, you have to be martyred for your faith. You will be killed during the tribulation. You got to be faithful to the Lord until death and become a martyr and join all of those. In verse 15, but here's the good news. Therefore, <clears throat> they are, the elders explaining to John, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. And they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not sh strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them <clears throat> and lead them to the living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so now in verses 15 through 17, we see the final blessed state of those who have been sovereignly sealed by God, by the Holy Spirit, by faith in Jesus Christ. And so let's look at their, their blessings. Verse 15, they stand in perfect nearness to God. They stand before the very throne of God with no barrier. They, can, they have direct line of sight, face-to-face -face access with God Almighty. <clears throat> and their lives have eternal meaning and purpose through the privilege of continual, unbroken service. In His temple they serve Him, both day and night. And so their lives have meaning. They have purpose. They're employed in the service of God in the temple, and they enjoy perfect fellowship. The one who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Verse 16, they enjoy total satisfaction. No more hunger, no more thirst, but they're filled with God's goodness and His supply. And they enjoy perfect protection from anything that would strike or harm them. So neither the scorching sun nor any intense heat can harm them. And so as I read this, I, I see that they've permanently moved out of the Central Valley. No more scorching sun, no more intense heat shall ever harm them. That sounds like my kind of place. I can't, I can't wait to get there, right? Beautiful. 
verse 17, they experience the Lord's guidance as the Lamb is their shepherd who leads them to fountains of living water. And in His presence, they they enjoy perfect joy. God Himself wipes away every tear from their eyes. Is there anything more tender than someone who loves you, who cares about you, who is a great friend or family member of you while you're hurting, while you're broken, and you got that teardrop, and they come and they comfort you and they take a tissue? Is there anything more tender and they wipe that away and they put their arms around you and say, hey, I love you, I understand, I'm here for you. Well, think about how much infinitely greater God Himself. Talk about intimate. Talk about comforting. Talk about creating joy. He comes and He's like, you will never cry again. Your days of tears are forever gone. You'll never cry in My presence. There's nothing to cry about. Isn't that amazing? That's one of the most beautiful Of course it touches our heart. That God Himself will wipe away the tear from every eyes. In reading these blessings of those who stand before the throne in heaven, who've been saved out of the great tribulation, sealed by God for salvation, I'm reminded of the shepherd psalm. Psalm 23. With Now, Psalm 23 is already tremendous. There's a couple upgrades in this list of blessings that go beyond Psalm 23 when we get to this final blessed state of the redeemed. And so, in the 23rd Psalm, the shepherd Psalm that David wrote, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Right, we read here how they're shepherded by the lamb, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I don't. I won't have any need of anything because of him and he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he provides a place where i can sleep so securely i have no fear i can lay down i can be i can rest and be totally at peace he restores my soul in heaven our souls are completely and forever restored you ever feel like you need some restoration of your soul feel like your soul is a little bit worn out a little bit weary from the road that you've had to walk god restores perfectly and forever it's the final restoration your soul will never feel like that again so broken and empty and hollow and hurting and aching and yearning for your maker and your creator He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. I won't ever be tempted to walk and wander down the path of evil that hurts me and destroys me and others. He leads me only in paths of righteousness. We won't walk on an evil path in heaven. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, fear no evil. Well, guess what? In, in heaven, here's your huge upgrade. <laughs> There's no more shadow of death. There's no more evil. This is better than the, the 23rd Psalm. And 23rd Psalm's awesome. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff that comfort me. Verse 5, you know, verse five of the 23rd Psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Guess what? In heaven, I don't have any enemies. Woo! Right? It gets better and better. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In placing these two visions, right, of of the 144,000 that are sealed, that first company of Jewish Christians, sealed by God, 
to evangelize and witness for him and to be safely make it through the tribulation. They won't be killed. They'll be preserved alive. And then in giving John the second vision of this multitude, you know, uh, of Gentiles who are saved out of the tribulation, God is strongly communicating that though he must bring judgment because he's a just and holy God, salvation belongs to our God and he's still sovereignly saving and perhaps more than any time of history, perhaps more people will get saved in that compressed, super intense time. And it's kind of like if there's ever a time to get saved, talk about if there's ever the world going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, I don't think you're going to beat. Nothing's going to take the cake on that. That's going to be the worst. How many will come to the Lord. We're told that it's an untold multitude that nobody could count from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation were saved out of the great tribulation. And they were they had to be martyred for their faith. But here they are. They're dressed in the white robes of righteousness standing before the throne. Palm branches of victory waving that would be a great worship service. And so, as we prepare to uh, take the Lord's Supper together, I just want to say, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room, but if it's not the case, or if there's someone who might be watching online, live, or maybe you're going to watch later on, on YouTube, you're going to hear this. All those blessings can be yours, they're available. Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed His blood for us on the, on the cross in sacrifice. And He made it available because of His great love with which He loved us. While we were still sinners, God demonstrated His life and sent Christ to die for us. Why would you, I'm just asking, I'm being honest, why would you not want all of those Blessings. Why would you not? What are you going to trade? What are you holding on to in this world that's so valuable, so important that you would trade your eternal soul? Could there be anything? If it's a matter of pride, you know, you need to humble yourself and just come to the Lord. Look at the goodness of God, even as He's judging the world in the time of the tribulation, as he must, to keep his word, fulfill his promise, and to be just. Yet he extends salvation to untold millions. And he's so determined to do it that he supernaturally, he saves, he seals, he commissions, he sends 12,000 from the 12 tribes, 144,000, and they start winning converts to the Lord. And I'm sure they start spreading and it starts spreading like wildfire. And what a beautiful scene. We're all going to be there. And I'm just going to say, don't miss it. What would you want to miss heaven for? He'll forgive your every sin. Whatever you've done, wherever darkness you've walked in, there's no darkness that his light can't penetrate and that he can't reverse. <clears throat> there's nothing that you've done that he can't undo. He will do it today. He'll do it now. All you got to do is pray. And, and as, as our brother said in the <clears throat> Sunday school, he talked about the thief on the cross. He, no one led him in the sinner's prayer. He didn't have a formula. He didn't know the Romans road. Romans wasn't even written yet. He didn't get baptized. He didn't have to become a member of a church. What did he have to do? Believe. He said, Lord... When you come into your kingdom, remember me, please. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Do you believe that Jesus went to his kingdom? You could be saved as easily as that thief on the cross. 
It's all for the asking. You just say, Lord, forgive me and fail me and save me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. And He will. And that's what we're going to celebrate right now. We're going to celebrate the very means that made that possible. The symbols of His broken body and His shed blood. And if you will receive His, his broken body and His shed blood and ask Him to forgive you, He will sovereignly seal you for salvation. It can never be undone. You'll be for, forever secure in Him. Brother Ponce. Thank you, Pastor. That was, true, that was truly encouraging. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's take a minute to reflect on the month and what we've done and ask the Lord to bring to remembrance anything that you've done to possibly offend the Lord and ask Him to forgive you. Like Pastor said, He's so willing, He's so just, and, and He's merciful and He will forgive you of your sins. Forgive me of my sins and He will cleanse us and we can have white robes too. So take a moment, please. Brother Tom, Brother Pete, can I have you join, join me? You know, as Pastor was preaching today, we read about 144,000 people who were sealed by God. And it seems pretty special, right? But I want you to know that if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit as well. We all have. And we too should be shouting and singing, that up there, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. So if you would repeat after me, please. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Men, would you pass out the bread, please?
The Bible says that for, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That our Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took some bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brother Tom, will you bless the bread, please? Amen. Can you please pass the juice, please? In the same manner, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brother Pete. Praise the Lord. Joseph. 